BBOR, Black Box, Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? I hope everyone had a good weekend. This episode is going to begin in a more somber way, because four days ago at the time of this recording, there was a shooting in Nevada at the UNLV campus, the University of Nevada at Las Vegas, that was committed by a Zodiac researcher named Tony Polito. And I did not know Tony personally, but I read his material in the past. I discussed him on some of the older episodes of Black Box Online Radio. And I mean older indeed. I did those episodes about four years ago, and I couldn't even find them. I never devoted an entire episode to one of his pieces, but some people had contacted me and said that the Nevada shooter left behind a Zodiac manifesto, and that doesn't appear to have been any type of new creation, and I also do not believe that his curiosity about the Zodiac killer mystery played a part in his choice to commit the shooting. Three people died and a fourth person was injured. Rest in peace to the victims, of course. But I believe that the motivation for this, as reported by the media, has been that Tony Polito was an out-of-work professor. He used to teach at East Carolina University, and he would talk to his students about how he loved the city of Las Vegas, and he was more or less a Las Vegas exploration buff, and he was trying to work at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He was a job applicant, and he was trying to seek a position there, but he was unsuccessful, and that perhaps played a larger role in the decision to commit this terrible action. And somebody else asked me the question, was he targeting his own students? And I think that is also highly unlikely because he was denied the job from my understanding. I didn't read anything that showed that he actually taught at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, or that he knew any of the victims. It seems like someone who was very upset about being turned down for a job, and that was the big focus. Tony Polito's mark in the Zodiac world was an attempt to solve the Z18 code. The Zodiac killer created ciphers, or cryptograms, and the first one was the 408 cipher, and the final line of the 408 cipher is called the Z18 code, which is an arrangement of letters that people have not been able to figure out to this day. Now, Tony Polito is someone whom, again, I read about four years ago, and I mean, believe it or not, when I discussed him on the channel, I was praising him for creating this little 15-page document, or however long it was, and giving it away for free, because some people charge money to read pamphlets like that, and um, it's really just about providing a solution to the Z18 code and saying how they did it, and I mean, I was like, he's giving it away for free, more people should do stuff like this if they just want to share their message, which they believe could be evidence in a homicide investigation, but I absolutely do not have anything praiseworthy to say about him now. In fact, many things to the contrary. His solution to the Z18 code revealed Mr. Arthur Lee Allen, and it's not exactly a simple substitution code, because there was a very um, intricate metric that he was using to rearrange the letters to get Mr. Arthur Lee Allen, but he did point out that Arthur Lee Allen's name had 16 letters, and by adding M-R at the beginning, Mr., that turns it into 18 letters, and I don't remember all the specifics about it. I was even trying to go through some of my old downloaded files to see if I still had the um, document that Tony Polito had created, and I don't have it anymore, and I'm not going to look too strongly for it, because Tony Polito seems like someone who lost control of his mental faculties, and somebody else also contacted me saying that they don't want to follow the Zodiac Killer case anymore, or they want to take a break from the Zodiac Killer mystery because they don't want to be associated with somebody like him, and I also don't believe that that's necessary because this appears to be someone who was troubled, and this was a lone gunman who, again, was dealing with some type of mental health issues, and I don't think anyone should think uh, badly about themselves for having a similar interest at one point in their lives. As previously stated, Tony Polito's Zodiac writings were around for years. I mean, I found them four years ago. I don't know when he actually wrote that document. But one more time, rest in peace to the victims of the Nevada shooting. And for this episode, I would like to focus on something right now. And this would have been the top story otherwise. And I have to give a shout out to Adam Ivester, who runs the YouTube channel Real Zodiac Killer Reveal 2023. Adam has been a guest on this program in multiple episodes. 
and Adam found something that might have been an inspiration for the Zodiac Killer's Lake Berryessa costume. On September 27th of 1969, the Zodiac Killer committed a crime by knife. It is the only confirmed stabbing that the Zodiac Killer did, and the other confirmed crimes the Zodiac used handguns. But he committed the murder of Brian Hartle and Cecilia Shepard while wearing a black hooded costume and it had a Zodiac Killer symbol, or the circle with the cross going through it, sewn in the center of the costume, described with as with care and precision. With care and precision. And the neatly sewn on circle and cross were white in color, and the Zodiac had clip-on sunglasses on the hood, and the top of it appeared to have been rectangular. Now, some people perhaps such as Sandy Betts, have even insinuated that it might have genuinely been a paper bag. The paper bag was fastened to a piece of cloth that would have appeared seamless in ways, but everybody looks at that for the first time, and they think, well, that rectangular shape looks like a shopping bag. What could be an alternative? One find from Adam Ivester is that his Zodiac Killer suspect, John Parr Cox, was very infatuated with Japanese history, Japanese theater. I mean, John Park Cox openly wrote about this, so those were strong interests of his. I don't want to mistake this next line. He was the ambassador to the Japanese society, um, you know, a prominent member of that, and and he, he I'm not even going to say any more of the specifics because I don't want to mistake them, but on his, one of his applications, he even wrote down that he was very passionate about Japanese history, and in Japan, they have the very famous Kabuki Theater, and the stagehands in Kabuki Theater wear a black costume that is very similar. The name of this costume is the Kuroko, and it's used because they want to have the stagehands and the stage manager wearing black in Kabuki Theater, so when they're trying to move props around on a set, there is just less focus on them, even if they are not a hundred percent invisible to the audience and hiding into the background in a seamless fashion. They are going to be disguised and also showing that they are not the focus of the play, whereas in a lot of other Western dramas, the stagehands don't wear black masks. In puppet theater, I mean, people also wear a very similar mask and costume, but Adam proposed that this could have been the inspiration for the Zodiac Killer's Lake Berryessa hood, or even more precisely, the Zodiac Killer could have used one of these hoods from the Japanese stagehands in the Kabuki Theater as the model for the Lake Berryessa hood, sewing on the circle with a cross going through it, and then adding on the clip-on sunglasses. And I have to uh, admit that this is a very big find, and this is a very similar similar costume to what the Zodiac Killer was wearing at Lake Berryessa, based on the illustrations that we have. There are no sightings um, that were recorded on cameras or videography or photography of the Zodiac Killer at Lake Berryessa. We mostly only have the testimonies of Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard. Cecilia Shepard passed away two days later, and Brian Hartnell would go on to survive. What do you think about this? Is this the Lake Berryessa hood. Is that what the Zodiac Killer did, that he took the the costume from the Japanese stagehands and then added on the modified features, the circle with the cross and the sunglasses, and maybe even something to to darken the visor? Because I've talked about this a lot in the past, that I believe that the Zodiac Killer already had the hooded costume. People are like, why would he wear this elaborate costume if he's just going to kill the victims? Some people think that the Zodiac wanted to keep the victims alive so they could tell the story about it and he would get a different image or a different reputation that would be shared about him in the media. And then other people think that he wore it because it had a specific meaning to him. I'm somewhat in the middle. I mean, I guess I'm more more just um, in my own camp when I think that he already had the costume and he easily modified it. Maybe he knew how to sew, maybe he knew how to attach the clip-on sunglasses rather effortlessly, and some people were quoting me as saying that I said this was the best example um, of a base material for the Lake Berryessa hood. Now, to be clear, I said it was one of the best examples. There are other possibilities how there as to how the Zodiac could have created the Lake Berryessa costume. And I'm not going to discredit the story of Sandy Betts, even though some people 
do not believe that the top part was made out of paper, because Sandy Betts says that the costume was then placed into her car, and she actually still has a portion of the cloth. So, I mean, I'm always just going to wait until the hard evidence comes out. In the past, I have proposed that this was similar to um, the Spanish copyrote, and the copyrote is a conical hood that is very similar to the ones that are worn by the Ku Klux Klan. They are not, though. They are used for traditional religious ceremonies in Spain, and when I saw them in black, then I immediately began to think, that's the Lake Berryessa hood, and they're also worn in Cadiz, Spain, and Cadiz, Spain is home to the largest military base, the largest naval base in Spain. It's a joint Spanish-American naval base, and all of the clues that we have pointing toward the Zodiac with some involvement in the military or the navy stand out to me. And I also have to be aware that 100%, we do not know yet what the exact source of the Zodiac's costume was. But the strong points that Adam has proposed is that the Zodiac talked about other Japanese references in his letters, particularly the Mikado. Okay, the Mikado is created by Gilbert and Sullivan, right? Not authentically Japanese, but very least, there is some type of Japanese connection to the Mikado. This is someone who has a slight infatuation with the theater. And what Adam talks about with his suspect, John Parr Cox, is there was a performance of the Japanese kabuki play, Kushigara that was going on in the theater district in San Francisco on October 11th of 1969, which was the date of the Zodiac's final confirmed crime, the murder of Paul Stein. And again, this is just showing that kabuki plays are performed at the time, and these types of hooded costumes perhaps were available. I'm going to ask you guys again, do you think this is what the Zodiac Killer used to make the Lake Berryessa hood? Now, some points against this would be, number one, in some versions of the stagehand mask, there is a very light-colored visor where, I mean, when I say light-colored, it's more like a screen, and it very clearly would show the person's face. And if I recall what Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard said was, there were eye holes that had the clip-on sunglasses on top of them. Now, some examples of the stagehand mask are darker than others. Some of them are more opaque. Not all of them are as transparent as others. And it appears in some of them that they don't even have the screen at all, that they are a more solid fabric. I think that that would be extremely risky for the Zodiac to go out with, like, a transparent type of screen mask. But not all of these hoods have that image. Another point about the Kuroko is that in most of them, there appears to be a slight narrowing around the head of the mask. By the head, I mean around the person's head underneath. And then it goes outward in somewhat of an elongated way. And the top rectangular part is actually longer than the part of the mask that would go around the person's neck, almost forming a trapezoidal type of shape, like how a trapezoid has one line that's longer than another, and then it's joined by two diagonal lines. And in all of the illustrations of the Zodiac Killer's hood at Lake Berryessa, I have not seen any of that. When you look at Grace Smith's illustration, which has been partnered and paired next to the Kuroko mask, that is very clearly a straight rectangle, also in the um, more forensic forensic sketch of the Zodiac Killer's hood, it does not have that type of trapezoid shape, but not all of the Kuroko masks had that particular type of narrowing around the person's head and then going straight down. Some of them are much more solid in shape with straight lines more or less forming at 90 degree angles. So I do have to give credit to Adam for this. This is very possible that this was the... Um, this was the source material for the Lake Berryessa hood. Some other examples that have been talked about are that it was an executioner's hood, or that it was something from a Renaissance fair. And I think I'm the first person to talk about how it could have been a copyrote hood. But I've been reading up more about how the uh, copyrotes were used in Spain. And to be honest, I could write a whole book on the evolution of these hoods going from Europe to the United States of America to the Zodiac Killer, just talking about the hooded costumes in general. 
because this stuff is very well documented. And with the copper rotes, not anyone can wear them. So I was under the impression, okay, maybe somebody was on a naval base in Spain and they obtained one from somebody, but that would actually go against the religious use of the copper rote. You're only supposed to wear it if you have been joined into the brotherhood of this, um, of the particular religious sect. And it's also used in a couple of different ways. There's actually um, a religious sect in Italy that wears the copper rote hoods, but they want to do it so they're showing that it's about repentance. They're repenting for sin, and they want people to focus on God and not the individual person who has committed the sin. I'm not going to elaborate on anything more than that, because that's why they wear them. And I mean, I don't think the Zodiac Killer would have cared about any of that stuff if he did indeed use the copper rote hood. But I do have to notice that the caparote almost always has solid material. Sometimes they are black, and that could easily be modified into a 90 degree angle at the top of the hood. You would just either cut the fabric or even fold the fabric down and use a couple inserts and it could be modified. And I've talked about how I believed that in the past that the circle with a cross was sewn over the emblem on the caparote because if they just had plain fabric, you could take a light-colored felt-tip pen and just draw a circle on there. But perhaps the Zodiac thought he couldn't remove the symbol without damaging it because it was sewn on, so he, so he had a different symbol sewn on top of it. What exactly do you think was the origin of the Lake Berryessa costume? And it's also possible that it was inspired by riot gear. And some of the other examples I've talked about in the past are a welder's outfit, a firefighter's outfit. Maybe it already existed in some way, and then there were simple modifications made to turn this into a bigger costume. What do you guys think? Right now, I would like to get to your supporter shoutouts from buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88 allows you to make a donation or a contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shoutout on Zodiac Monday. And our first shoutout comes to us from Batman66. Batman, thank you so much for your regular and consistent support. And the next one comes to us from River Prawn Pottery. You two guys have been absolutely amazing with all of that. Very regular and consistent, and I thank you so much for that. And our next one comes to us on buymeacoffee.com from Mike F., who says, Greetings from Texas. Well, hey, greetings from the Philippines. Yes, I am in the Philippines now, but always coming to you from West Virginia at heart. And a lot of people that I've been talking about for the interview segments still think that I am in West Virginia. And there actually will not be any of the any true crime interviews coming out this week. I'm still going to make some episodes for you guys. But my true crime interviews that I had pre-recorded for this week were confiscated by the CIA. I kid thee not, and I will... I'll, t I'll talk more about that tomorrow. I mean, allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. i got to be more careful with my language. Please tune into tomorrow's episode if you want to hear more. And also giving a shout-out to Andrew WVA, who shared this West Virginia image with me, because he knows that I miss the place. And our next one comes to us from Sean Menzies on buymeacoffee.com. And Sean says, Hey Ned, I just wanted to say thank you so much for providing me and many others with so much great content. Love all of your videos and just wanted to say thanks and keep up the great work from Sean. Hey, you're welcome. And you know, it's no trouble at all. I've been talking to you guys about these true crime stories for years and everything is moving on strongly. And our next supporter on buymeacoffee.com is Drew, who says, being weird is a misdemeanor. Just joking. Keep up the great content, Ned. Ah, oh, yes, and everybody remember, being weird is not a crime. Maybe a misdemeanor. No, no, joking as well. Being weird is not a crime. And we have one from Jeff Jones on buymeacoffee.com. And Jeff says, Love your work, Ned. Thank you for giving us the audiobook for free. And he's talking about the audiobook for Killer on a White Horse, A Story of the Evening Watchman. That is the novel that I wrote about three years ago. And I had it out in Kindle version. It was only designed as an ebook. I mean, I didn't really think that anyone else would want the paperback, and then a lot of people were saying they wanted a paperback version, so I made it available. But I had to be honest that I didn't use a professional editor. There were so many typos in it, and I didn't feel comfortable keeping it like up for sale. And I haven't taken the link out of the description box simply because I haven't bothered. But somebody had asked me once would I put a free chapter of the book available as an audio 
book form in audiobook format. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to make the audiobook for free. And last Sunday, I created the final segment. The entirety of Killer on a White Horse, a story of the Evening Watchman, is available. And then I'm going to be releasing my second book, Down the Dark Lane, as an audiobook as well. And please, please, if you're listening to this, do not buy them from Amazon.com. I'll probably take them down in the future if I ever get around to it. I invite you to just listen to the audiobooks for free, and I think it will be a much better experience. And I'm already working on the next segment of the White Horse Killer Saga. The next um, story is, well, it's on the keyboard right now, and I'm trying to make some progress on that one. So if you haven't hit the like button and subscribed yet to Black Box Online Radio, please feel free to do so. You can follow along with Zodiac Monday, all of the other true crime interviews and discussions that will happen on this channel, and even things about fiction like Killer on a White Horse and the next stories in the White Horse Killer Saga. Now, last week on the channel, I was talking to you guys about a book called Titwillow that was written by Judith Chapman, and she has a Zodiac Killer suspect named Peter Plant. It was her ex-husband, or perhaps late husband is the best way to put it. He was her late husband, I think is the best way to put it. And even though I wasn't completely sold on her narrative from the sample that I was able to obtain from Kindle, I'm, I mean, just getting slightly under the surface with her Zodiac theory, I was also reading through some of the reviews of her book, and a lot of people thought that she was zoning in too much on her personal story and talking about, okay, she knew the family of Peter Plant, and there were some personal stories that she was sharing about Peter and the family. But to give credit to Judith Chapman, even from reading the sample from Kindle, she gets to the point, she tells you who her suspect is, she tells you some basic facts about him, and she talks about some of the reasons why she thought he was the Zodiac Killer, that's actually commendable, because I picked up a book called The Zodiac Affair from Faisal Zarawi, and, and this is one that, again, just reading the free sample, and I could barely get through this thing. It was a struggle, because so much of it are just these personal anecdotes talking about eating dinner with the family and so on, and they're not even true crime related, and it's just going on and on and on about things that are just off-topic, and some people are trying to create this type of fun, easy-going, free-flowing discussion, but at the same time, they're not getting to the point, though, and that one was a little bit more of a struggle. So, I'm going to spend a little bit more time with Judith Chapman's material, and I want to see what she can uncover in her book, Tit Willow, and I have to thank Batman66 once again for recommending that one to me. Now, there is a Zodiac letter that was written in 1974 that is a possible Zodiac communication, and it is the Badlands card, which came out in May of 1974, and I've talked to you guys about it a lot before, but the Badlands card references a movie of the same name, and I'm just going to read the text one more time. Sirs, I would like to express my consternation concerning your poor taste and lack of sympathy for the public as evidenced by your running of the ads for the movie Badlands, featuring the blurb, In 1959, most people were killing time. Kit and Holly were killing people. In light of recent events, this kind of murder glorification can only be deplorable at best. Not that the glorification of violence was ever justifiable. Why don't you show some concern for public sensibilities and cut the ad? And it's signed, A Citizen. Note, it is not signed the Zodiac, because the Zodiac killer wrote letters up until 1971, and then there's the halt in Zodiac activity for 1972 and 73. The Zodiac would then restart in 1974 with the Exorcist letter. And to give credit to Tom Void of ZodiacKiller.com, one point that I dismissed in the past was that the Zodiac had reinvented himself as somewhat of a film buff post-1974, and I was like, well... I Anyone could reference movies or something referencing contemporary films. Anybody could do that. I didn't necessarily think that would mean that the Zodiac was a film buff. But when you actually look at things in order, you have the Exorcist letter, which very clearly is talking about the Exorcist. You have the Count Marco letter, which could either be referencing the Red Phantom or talking about how the Zodiac is trying to take on a new identity. And it doesn't even have to only be movies. It could also be theater. Think about how we said the Zodiac has mentioned other uh, theatrical references in the past. Let, let alone, the Zodiac very clearly talks about the most dangerous game, 
the story of hunting people for sport, but that could be referring to one of the film versions and not necessarily the um, piece of literature. Then in 1974, there's a direct reference to the movie Badlands, and giving a shout out to Sphere the Cube, who had just asked me this question a couple times, have you watched the movie Badlands yet? And Sphere has been encouraging me to watch that one, and I finally did. Badlands starring Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek. And this is a movie that is based on the Starkweather Fugate murders from the 1950s. Oh, just going off of memory right now, was it 1957 and into 1958? But it's still a very short amount of time. And Charlie Starkweather was a spree killer, and he was a murderer who gained some nationwide fame and recognition for his horrible, horrible actions. And there have been multiple movies that have been made about the Starkweather Fugate murders, even Natural Born Killers, and one of the ones that I've referenced on the channel before is a miniseries featuring Tim Roth called Murder in the Heartland. But when I watched Badlands, I could understand how somebody like the Zodiac would be frustrated with it, because you heard the text of the Badlands card. It talks about how murder glorification is deplorable. It talks about how that um, he wants to express consternation for the poor taste and lack of sympathy. And some people might be looking at that and they would think, well, now, wait a second, is this even a Zodiac letter? Was this just written by a real citizen who just didn't like the ads for the movie? Or was this the Zodiac killer trying to be satirical, making fun of something to prove a point? Or is the Zodiac trying to adopt a different type of personality? And... I'll share with you what I genuinely think. Let's say hypothetically, hypothetically, if this is a real Zodiac communication, the movie Badlands is all about how there is there are two people. One is named Kit and one is named Holly, Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek. And Martin Sheen goes on the killing spree. And Sissy Spacek is more or less just an observer. And she's going along with things and not trying very hard to resist or fight back or preventing him from doing things. But I think that what would really bother the Zodiac about this is everybody in the movie seems to like Martin Sheen's character to a certain extent. This character based on Charlie Starkweather. And the real-life Charlie Starkweather was not likable at all, in my opinion. The media that we do have of him, he appears to be just an ordinary criminal thug. But even in one of the um, promotional pictures, they talk about how uh, Kit from the movie Badlands is combing his hair and styling it like James Dean. And if you watch the movie, he's just kind of getting along with people and making them laugh and so on, and they think that he's cool. I absolutely do not think that we're supposed to think he's cool in the audience. I mean, people are supposed to watch the movie and be like, oh, this guy's just a sleaze bag and smooth talker that's deceiving everybody. That's what I think the audience is supposed to think. But somebody like the Zodiac would probably be very bothered by that, because as a real murderer, the Zodiac was probably none of those things. I don't think the Zodiac was a smooth talker, or likable, or charismatic, or fun to be around at all, whoever was writing this card. And giving a shout out to Mike Rodelli, who came up with the observation that if you look at the Badlands card, and then go backwards in time, you'll notice how the Badlands card, if this is indeed the Zodiac, it says words like consternation, concerning, and I mean, someone made a direct effort to spell consternation correctly. The word consternt is crossed out, and consternation is then spelled correctly. Yet the Zodiac Killer couldn't spell the word Christmas in the 1969 letters. So, number one, the Zodiac misspellings could be completely intentional. I think they are. But this shows that the Zodiac does show have some type of desire to spell words correctly. Now, you might be noticing that I've said in the past, I think very clearly, that the last letters were in 1974, but I'm always open to the possibilities. The 1974 Exorcist letter is highly regarded as the Zodiac's final communication that was confirmed to be from the killer, but I always keep an open mind. There's a lot of evidence that would suggest that the Zodiac did indeed write the Count Marco letter, the SLA letter, and the Badlands card, and even the 1978 letter. So, the other day, I couldn't sleep, and I was just pulling up something from YouTube, anything to watch, and one video that was recommended to me was an episode of Planet X Filmworks that featured Thomas Henry Horne and Richard Grinnell, 
Richard Grinnell is the webmaster for ZodiacCiphers.com, and he was talking about how he believes that the 1987 letter is authentic. And I've heard Richard give his explanation before. I interviewed him for the Zodiac Killer Channel's interview with the Expert series. And to be very honest, I wasn't convinced about it, because he talks about how there's some similar wording on the envelope from the 87 letters compared to the 1969 letters. And I was like, yeah, okay, I mean, similar wording, sure. But I've always been on the skeptical side. And as of now, I would still state that the final letter that I would say is confirmed is the 1974 Exorcist letter. I want to be very clear about that. I just think that there are strong possibilities of the previous letters that I've talked about being authentic. The SLA letter, Count Marco letter, Badlands card, and Richard does provide somewhat of a convincing case for the um, 1987 letter, which I'll read to you right now. Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. I am crackproof. Tell Herb Cain that I am still here. I have always been here. Tell the Blue Pigs, if want me, I will be driving around on Halloween in my death machine looking for some kitties to run over. Cars make... Cars make... Great weapons. Cars make nice weapons. Wow, the Zodiac's handwriting is terrible. Their pigs can catch me if they can find me out there, just like in the movie The Car. Tell the kitties to watch before they cross the street on Halloween night. Tell Toski my new plans, yours truly. And then there's the Zodiac symbol, VPD, zero. So the points for the 1987 letter being authentic would be, number one, there's a movie reference, and as we said, the Zodiac has now been reinvented as a film buff, re talking about the movie The Car. Number two, the Zodiac calls out Herb Kane, who has been addressed before. And if the 1978 letter is authentic, Dave Toski was called out by the Zodiac. He calls him that city pig, Toski, and Dave Toski is mentioned there. And also, there is a big difference, though. Because for the letters in 1974, they do not say this is the Zodiac speaking. Maybe the 78 letter is authentic. That would be the revival of this is the Zodiac speaking, which would be used in other communications. The 1986 letter would be another example of one uh, post-74 post that says this is the Zodiac speaking. But Richard's observations aren't necessarily about the content or text of the letters. What he was talking about was the envelope. And the envelope... I mean, comparing to a letter that was mailed in 1969 to the Vallejo Times Herald, both of them say Vallejo Times Herald, and the word Herald is misspelled. And then it says, please rush to editor, but please rush to editor is written twice on both of the F envelopes, albeit in different places. But that phrase is written twice there, and both of them seem to have the Zodiac Killer's very odd letter J shape. And... I mean, Richard does make somewhat of a convincing case and of for that, and I've been very dismissive of the past, and again, always holding back a little bit, and I wouldn't necessarily endorse um, a theory like that and go completely gung-ho for it, but I have to give credit where credit is due, and I do think that that is a solid observation, because what Richard's claim was is that in 1987, somebody should not have had access to the envelopes and the writing on the envelopes from the media. So that brings up two possibilities. Number one, it was written by the real Zodiac. Or number two, some way, somehow, somebody had the opportunity to view it in the police archives. But what do you guys think? Do you believe that either the Badlands card from 74 or the letter from 1987 were authentic? Some challenge questions for you guys. I've shared more or less my take on the subject. As of now, I still have to say, no, maybe they're unconfirmed, but very high possibilities. And that would be one thing that Richard has persuaded me on. It's going 87 letter, going from a hard no to now. It's quite possible. So I give credit to Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com. And now for this next segment here, I want to bring back something from the past, and that is the debunking series. And I'm going to play an audio clip, and this is me talking about the Zodiac Killer suspect, Michael Henry O'Hare. And Michael O'Hare is the suspect of Gareth Penn and Ray Grant. And Ray Grant has been doing a series called Zodiac Killer Walkthrough, and even though Ray Grant no longer watches my channel, I try to watch all of his videos. He puts them out faster than I can watch them. They're about two and a half hours long in each one of them. And if you do watch anything from Ray Grant's Zodiac series, I recommend his video on the death of Robert Salem. On Robert Salem, that episode 
was just excellent. It's not only the true crime stuff. It's, I mean, he's talking about how criminals think and how criminals would make their plans. So it is true crime, but not necessarily focusing on the action of murder and cover-ups. But there was just so much information in there that I thought was very beneficial. So one more time, Zodiac Killer walked through Robert Salem on Ray Grant's channel. But I've expressed a lot of doubt about Michael O'Hare in the past as a Zodiac Killer suspect. I included him in the debunking series. In 2021, I started this because I wanted to talk about Zodiac Killer suspects that I thought were absolutely not the Zodiac, or at the very least there was an extremely low possibility. And one of them that I included was Michael Henry O'Hare, and I invite you guys to find the playlist for that one if you just want to hear a very casual discussion. Although, I will say, I'm not going to make this a regular habit of including old episodes into Zodiac Monday, but here is a segment of my episode on Michael Henry O'Hare to play us out. And firstly, firstly, for some reason back in 2021, I decided to staple a bunch of Brillo pads to my face. I don't know why I did that, I can't honestly tell you. And I did want to wear a red shirt in honor of Gareth Penn's book cover for Time 17, and I tilted it at an artificial angle of 117 degrees, which shows that Michael Henry O'Hare used that angle in some of the plans and designs for not only his architectural creations, but also Riverside, California, where Sherry Jo Bates was murdered in 1966, was on the 117th degree of latitude, and that was also a terrible decision. Yeah, but without further ado, here is the video clip, and I just want to let you guys know that this uh, video clip is brought to you by Capital One. If you sign up for the Capital One Quicksilver card, you will get $200 as a sign-on bonus. I kid thee not, that is a real offer. It's like getting free money handed to you. Please feel free to have a look at the link in the description box, as well as the one pinned with the quick reference. And here is the Zodiac Killer debunking series to play us My out. Name is Ned, and I'm the host of Black Box Online Radio. Welcome to the debunking series, where I'm going to be talking about some of these Zodiac suspects that I think are absolutely not the Zodiac Killer, and the reasons for that. One of which is Michael O'Hare, somebody who was mentioned in the book Time 17 by Gareth Penn. This book came out in the late 1980s, and it approached the Zodiac Killer mystery in a very different way. I can only gather that part of that was to differentiate Gareth Penn's publication from that of a previous Zodiac book, Zodiac by Robert Graysmith, which came out in 1986. But yes, Michael O'Hare was accused of committing not only the four canonical Zodiac crimes, the five murders from the 1960s, Gareth Penn also tried to link Michael O'Hare to the 1981 murder of Joan Webster in Massachusetts. Let's look at some of the evidence that Gareth Penn has put forward. Number one, the bodies of water connection. Michael O'Hare's initials are M H O. Michael Henry O'Hare. But O'Hare can almost be two initials, right? So M H O H. And then Gareth Penn began to notice that a lot of the Zodiac crimes seem to have occurred near bodies of water. Lake Herman Road, Blue Rock Springs, Lake Berryessa. Presidio Heights, wait a second. Oh yeah, that's right. The murder occurred on Washington Street, the corner of Washington and Cherry and Washington and Maple, that part of Presidio Heights. And Gareth Penn thought that wash was a body of water. Well, it sounds like water, it's water related, right? Right. I give him credit for the first three ones that we just listed off. The first Zodiac crime was Lake Herman Road, the second one, Blue Rock Springs. In the third one, Lake Berryessa. But even to further his idea about this bodies of water connection and how that is some type of clue into the Zodiac Killer's identity, he said that there was a fire hydrant near where Paul Stein was murdered on October 11th of 69. Paul Stein's taxi wasn't too far away from a fire hydrant. Hydrants have water, right? Are you following me? The Zodiac is cluing us in to something about his identity involving bodies of water, and maybe it's his initials. What if his initials were H-O-H, two H's and one O, H-2-O, oh my goodness, this is so brilliant. 
So naturally, he went with Michael O'Hare as a suspect, someone who does not have the initials H-O-H or H-H-O. His first name is Michael. That begins with a different letter. But we can even give that Michael H2O, all right? M-H-O-H, Michael Henry O'Hare. Michael O'Hare um, is someone who is very well educated. He went to Harvard University. He went on to become a lecturer on public policy. And I believe um, I mis made a mistake once on the channel saying that he had a PhD in mathematics. I believe his degree is actually in architecture. And I've actually been reading some of Michael O'Hare's articles that he has published about architecture museums and the policies that should be associated with them, though they're very dense, but we can talk about that at a different time. All right, so Michael Water, M-H-O-H, Michael H-2-O, did he actually commit this, this set of murders that took place? Well, Garrett Penn didn't only look at the bodies of water connection. He also heavily, heavily got focused on mathematical signatures. In fact, if you read the book Time 17 by Gareth Penn, he talks very clearly about how he thinks that the Zodiac crimes were a criminal masterpiece that were just filled with mathematical signatures. And you're dealing with somebody who was very well educated and someone who had a high understanding of math, angles, somebody like an architect would, or someone who was educated at the graduate level. Okay, I can follow all of that, except for some of the ways that Garrett Penn would go about this, saying not only the canonical Zodiac crimes, 68 and 69, but also trying to implicate Michael O'Hare in the 1966 murder of Sherry Jo Bates. After Sherry Jo Bates was murdered on October 30th of that year, there was a watch band that had been worn by the perpetrator that had been ripped off, and this was a Timex watch, and Garrett Penn devised this intricate way of first converting letters and words into binary and then into Morse code, more Morse code into binary, then taking his hand, putting it up his own ass, pulling out the kitchen sink, throwing it in the middle, burning the entire house down. <clears throat> and all of a sudden you get the number 617, which is an area code in the state of Massachusetts. Michael O'Hare went to college in Massachusetts. Michael O'Hare has all kinds of connections to Massachusetts. Michael O'Hare lived in Massachusetts for many years. Anybody can fudge the facts that way. Anybody can rearrange numbers into different patterns. And that doesn't mean that they were the Zodiac Killer. And it also doesn't mean that it is the intended criminal signature. And Gareth Penn openly talked about this in the book Time 17 when he makes an observation of his own about his own mathematical findings. Hey, what a funny coincidence. If he can do it, well, why couldn't coincidences also be attributed to Michael O'Hare? And you can pretty much break down this method of saying, hey, did you know that two plus three equals five? How many fingers on one hand? Let's all count together. It's ridiculous. It's an impractical way. Because not only did Gary Penn have an absolute reversal on this later in life, saying that messing... And once again, that was from the Zodiac Killer Debunking series. Thank you so much for listening to this week's Zodiac Monday. One more time, you can hit the like button and subscribe. And for now, goodbye.